Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the UBI Research and Technology Park Specialized Tax Incentive Program webinar. My name is Yi Han Wang. I'm the Manager for Foreign Direct Investment and Sustainability at the RT Park, and I'll be monitoring today's webinar. Today, we'll discuss how we can, uh, how technology and knowledge-based companies can access tax credits operating in the U.S. Virgin Islands and other tax implement, uh, implications businesses should consider expanding or relocating to this American paradise. Before I start, um, I'll quickly run through today's agenda. I'll share my screen. Okay. So for today's agenda, um, we have four speakers. First of all, I will turn the floor to the CEO and the president of the RT Park, Peter Chapman. Peter will provide us an overview of the organization and who we are looking for for this tax incentive program. Next, we will have Shivan Chopa, a senior manager of business development operations and compliance, to walk us through details of the tax incentive program, qualifications, eligibility, fee structure, and the process to participate in this program. Next, we'll turn the floor to Erica Killerhouse and Julie Roberts. Both of them are experienced local tax attorneys, and they will walk us through how we set up to provide tax incentives and what qualities, or what qualifications um, a business need to be in the RT Park program. Finally, we'll have 10 minutes for Q&A. Please feel free to use the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of the screen throughout the webinar for questions and comments. We'll monitor the Q&A um, throughout the webinar and answer them at the appropriate time. The attendees will be in listen-only mode during the webinar. The slides and recordings will also be made available by email shortly after the webinar. It will also be posted on our website in the next few days. Now let's welcome Peter Chapman, the Executive Director, CEO, and the President at the RT Park to start the webinar. Mr. Chapman has over 20 years executive leadership experience in larger U.S. markets and previously served as the head of several public, quasi-public economic development organizations with robust lending programs. Peter has also uh, Peter was also the past advisor to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and other institutional investors in economic and community development. He established several funds um, and successfully secured and placed new market tax credits, a uh, hot section 108 loan capital for anchor real estate projects and helped leverage millions in private investment and promoted job reta retention and expansion. Now, without further ado, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Yihan, and good afternoon and welcome to uh, all of our guests uh, who are joining us for what uh, I believe will be a, a brief but substantive uh, and informative uh, webinar on our tax incentive uh, program. And let me also, before I uh, just offer a little bit of perspective, thank uh, uh, our tax attorney uh, friends, uh, Jory Roberts and Erica Kellerhals for lending their, uh, their tremendous knowledge and expertise to this, uh, to this engagement. So thank you to, uh, to you both. Just to set the stage uh, a little bit for today's uh, discussion, I wanna start off by just talking about what kind of entity, what kind of animal uh, the RT Park is. Uh, when people hear our name, um, so they call us the RT Park or the Research and Technology Park Corporation, they uh, instantaneously think that we are some kind of think tank or some sort of research uh, institute. We are not uh, researchers uh, at all. What we are is a technology focused or technology based economic development organization. And we were established in 2002 uh, through um, uh, legislation uh, that was passed by the Virgin Islands uh, Senate um, 
to really create a mechanism for expanding, diversifying, and strengthening the Virgin Islands economy uh, beyond tourism, rum, rum uh, production, uh, oil production, and things like uh, that. So we are a public-private partnership um, that is engaged in technology-based uh, economic development. And we do that work in two, uh, really two major ways. One is through what we call sector-based attraction, sector-based business uh, recruitment. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit more detail uh, in a second. The other uh, principal uh, activity uh, for us is uh, what we call business acceleration. So we identify early stage firms, promising early stage firms, and we put them through an intensive, um, comprehensive program that is designed to take them from where they are to where they uh, need to be and want to be. So in that respect, we're modeled, uh, uh, modeled on best practices in places like Austin, Texas, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and in Silicon uh, Valley. Um, we are very, uh, as this slide suggests, uh, we are, uh, we're sector uh, oriented, which means that we don't, um, we don't spread ourselves too thinly in terms of who we market ourselves to. We like companies in the uh, IT space or in various IT uh, spaces, um, but we'll go on to the next, uh, go on to the next slide. So what this says is basically that we have a partnership with the, uh, with the University uh, of the Virgin Islands. So we are a, an affiliate of the University of the Virgin Islands, an independent uh, affiliate. And so the partnership uh, with them entails harnessing their talent uh, for the benefit of technology and knowledge-based uh, firms, uh, primarily. Um, uh, but let me come back to uh, the sector, the sector focus uh, a little bit. Uh, so in addition to IT, uh, we also focus keenly on financial technology, healthcare and life sciences related uh, uh, industries and technologies, and also sustainable development, which we can talk about du during, uh, during Q&A. Next slide, please. So this uh, basically goes to what we call uh, the value proposition. And uh, the bottom line here is that we, uh, we operate under the protection of US law and US currency. And we have a strategic location that is uh, two and a half uh, hours uh, south of Miami. And we are just east of, uh, east of Puerto Rico. Next slide, please. So this also speaks uh, what we view as being a compelling part of the Virgin Islands uh, value proposition, and that is quality of life. <laughs> that is the, that's the bottom line. Next slide. Business climate. So this simply lays out uh, what I said at the outset about our sector uh, focus. But just to give you give you a little bit more detail to touch upon some of these areas uh, in a little bit more detail. So uh, so I talked about IT uh, in general and fintech as one area of IT that we are keenly interested in, and that includes uh, mobile technologies, uh, digital only banks, biometric technologies and uh, firms that are engaged in various types of blockchain uh, technology. In the area of healthcare and life sciences, uh, we have a particular interest in uh, medical device companies uh, and personalized medical uh, applications companies. So, you know, one of the things that you see with our sector strategy is that there is a lot of interconnectedness and a lot of overlap. So the healthcare space uh, includes a big focus on what are essentially IT related uh, companies and, and technologies. That's, that's the bottom line here. Um, I, I mentioned at the outset our interest in sustainable development, and that is a very, very broad category, but let me drill down a little bit and tell you what we are talking about when we talk about sustainable development. We are talking about companies that operate 
in the uh, clean energy uh, space. We are talking about companies that operate in the sustainable agriculture uh, space and also companies that are involved in marine, uh, in marine technologies and marine uh, science. Uh, and then the last uh, broad category here is what we call business process outsourcing. And that includes everything from customer support centers, corporate centers of excellence, uh, to shared service centers, data centers, data storage centers, and, uh, and entities, uh, entities like, uh, like that. So uh, not to get too long-winded or too technical about business process outsourcing, but as some of you know, uh, there are a number of jurisdictions in the Caribbean that um, have really done very well at attracting corporate um, uh, business process outsourcing uh, functions. And so we believe that we can also be very competitive in this space. So this is a critical focus for us. And finally, with respect to our tech uh, sector and sustainable development uh, cluster focus, uh, I think it's important to underscore the fact that while we are very targeted, we are also creative and very open, which means that if you uh, bring a company to us that is not within one of these uh, sectors, but it is a company that uh, would add uh, a lot of value to the community and to the overall ecosystem, we would certainly take a very close look at it. So while we want you to know what type of companies we go after proactively, we don't want you to think that we uh, are myopic in terms of how we go about um, evaluating uh, companies that wanna come into our program. Next slide. So I'm going to let uh, my colleague Siobhan Chopa talk about the tax benefits uh, in more detail, but I think it's, uh, it's important uh, to underscore the fact that tax benefits, tax incentives factor prominently in the value proposition and in how we go about marketing ourselves. Um, tax benefits are not uh, an end unto themselves, but they are for us an extremely important tool that we use to attract entrepreneurs and technology and knowledge-based companies from the United States, primarily. So with that said, I believe that uh, Siobhan Chopa will Thank now you. address the group. Thank Thanks, you. Um, now, um, let me introduce Siobhan. Uh, to uh, everyone. So Shawan works directly with RT Park clients with, uh, to guide them through the application process to the tax incentive program. She will ensure businesses remain in compliance with program requirements, as well as connecting clients to enrichment opportunities with the University of the Virgin Islands. Now, Shawan, please take it over. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, as Ihan said, my name is Siobhan. I'm the Senior Manager of Business Development Operations and Compliance. Um, so that my primary role is leading clients through the application process. So that's making sure that you have everything you need and um, any guidance you need when you make the decision to enter into the RG Card program. Um, thanks, Peter, for the introduction. Um, Peter has been with us for a couple of years and I've been with the Arts Park for, for a couple more years than that. Um, we're very lucky to have Peter with us and he's very humble, but I would just like to point out and make sure everybody knows that under his direction, uh, last year, Arts Park won the Economic Development Organization of the Year Award from the uh, IEDC, the International Economic Development Council, which is a huge honor. So we're very lucky to have Peter with us and he's led us in great, great thing, doing great things. Um, so I'm going to start today by talking to you about what the benefits are of being into the program. So let me share my screen. All right. So what do you get if you decide to, to, to join the RT Park? First and foremost, as Peter said, of course, are the tax incentives. Uh, that tends to be what draws people in. Uh, we have a very um, lucrative tax, tax incentive program. So 
Um, I'll just highlight, highlight a few of those for you. So you've got a 90% reduction in your income tax liabilities. Um, you've got an exemption on, on taxes and uh, your property taxes to the extent that they're used by the company. So um, if you have office space and things like that, uh, you have an exemption, a complete exemption on your gross receipt taxes, an exemption on excise taxes, uh, both on building materials and raw materials. So if you're having to build your own property or um, the product that you're developing, there's an exemption on the taxes for those. Um, you have an exemption on your withholding tax in respect to interest uh, and a four your reduction from 4% to 1%. No, that's the next one. And a 4% withholding tax deduction for dividends and royalties, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, there's also the reduction in custom duties. Um, and it's worthy to note that these benefits apply to shareholders and members and beneficiaries, um, any, any of whom are bona fide residents of the Virgin Islands. And when Jory and Erica talk a little bit later, they're gonna tell you uh, what, what those requirements are. Um, and it's also notable that once you become a member of the program and you enter into the contract, which is usually 15 years, um, you, any change that applies in the law is not applicable to you. You would still be eligible for any of uh, the benefits that, that you qualified for when you entered. Aside from that, Archie Park can offer our clients um, office space, both uh, temporary and we are excited to be developing some longer term office space availability. So the first option is our Archie Park HQ. Um, which is this beautiful building you're seeing here where I'm sitting right now. Uh, so in this building, this is on the UVI campus. We've got two on St. Tom, on St. Croix, uh, two uh, private meeting rooms. So if you if if companies need space, if they don't have a physical office here, but they want to have space for meetings, we have two private meeting rooms available. We have one very large conference center, which is top top notch state of the art, um, which is available to our clients, but we also rent it out um, for events and things like that. And we of course use it ourselves for events. Uh, we have eight individual workspaces available here. So this is if your company comes in and uh, you, you have employees that come in from out of town or you just need a space for whatever reason to do work for a few days, um, we have some workspaces available as well. Uh, the RT Park executive office is here and our team offices are here. Uh, it's a beautiful building. I highly recommend coming to take a look at it. We also share it with the UVI math and science department. So uh, we've got state of the art um, uh, laboratories in the building as well, which are pretty cool to see. We also have um, a co-working space. So the RT Park has a program, Accelerate VI, which is uh, the only accelerator program in, in the Virgin Islands, so one of the few in the Caribbean. Um, and part of what the program has is this co-working space. So think like WeWorks. Um, so within that space, we have two private conference rooms. We have four phone booths. So those are, so they're, if you needed a little bit more of a private space for phone calls than that, it's a, it's a small private, think the size of a phone booth. Um, and then aside from that, we have an open concept shared workspace. So you can come in for a day. Um, we do rent more permanent desks. So if you knew you needed it for a month or something like that, that's available for you as well. Um, we, we offer there, we offer a mailing address service. So if you need to have for some reason a, um, a USBI address, it's available to use. Of course, our clients would have their own address, but. This is a service that we also offer after COVID <laughs> to the public as well. Um, and this location is right in downtown Christian Fed. So it's right by the waterfront, it's by all the restaurants and everything. It's a great location. Um, our staff is lucky we can alternate between <laughs> the two. So depending on our mood, Peter's over there in the co-working space and I'm over here on, on, on the UVI campus. And then we have our RT Park Tech Village project, project. So this is an exciting project that RT Park has taken on. Um, it is a mixed use economic development project. It's the first of its kind in the territory. Uh, it's, it has um, housing, it has conference room space, it has farming land, it has office space. So this will have some of the more permanent office space available. 
Um, it also has a teaching, we'll have a teaching hotel, um, which is great for the university. The university has a pretty extensive hospitality program. So this is gonna be a great asset for the university, a great draw to students um, to bring students in as well as of course, to, to assist the, the existing students. Um, so we're looking to break ground on this project this year, hopefully next quarter or so. Um, it's really exciting. And the RT Park is, is really doing um, a great service to the territory, I think, by doing this project. Here's some pictures for you. So this is the rendering. And then this kind of shows you where everything is. So, and this is actually located directly across from the, the UVI campus where, where our headquarters are. So I could walk across right now. <laughs> um, so one of the other benefit, big benefit to, that we have in the program is access to capital. So the RT Park will be managing what's called the Catalyst Fund. So this is a $35 million capital pool um, that provides patient flexible debt options for businesses both within the RT Park and outside of the RT Park. So this will be available. Um, RT Park, of course, is focused on tech, but this will be available for applications for entities out who are not tech as well. Um, primary, uh, the, the initial consideration will go to primarily RT Park clients when we first get started, but as we expand, it will expand outside of that. This is something if you have if you have more questions about, I highly recommend talking to uh, Peter outside of this. He can tell you all about it. We've been working really hard on this for a long time. It's really exciting because it's something the territory really needs, and it's it's very exciting. So you also have access to the RT Park network. So since as of January, we have 66 clients in our traditional program. As I mentioned, we also have an accelerator program. And within that, I think we have 12 accelerator companies. Um, you can see the segments based on what Peter was talking about earlier. And these are just a few examples, but one of the great things about the territory being the size it is and, and the community that's here is that you really can connect with people and RT Park clients know each other. And if you, have questions or or need anything or need advice or just you know where to go get the best lobster roll <laughs> you uh, Caribbean lobster is great um, these people are easily accessible to you and the RT Park tries really hard to connect everybody so we prior to COVID of course it's been a little bit harder over the last year or so but we held networking events to ensure that that the companies were meeting each other both for just Personal, re personal reasons so that you could make some friends when you move here, but also to assist with, with your business when with other people who are doing uh, similar things and have been in the territory for a while. So this network I think is very valuable and one of the, it's one of the valuable assets of, of being in the park. The connection to the university. So um, the RT Park clients commit in different ways to the university. And last year, uh, the contribution, total contributions were over $2 million. The way that you partner with the university is really unique and it's really unique to the companies. Um, when you go through your application process, you have a meeting, a direct meeting with the president of the university. And you talk about ways that you can assist the university, areas that might be of interest to you. What are your business strengths and what are your interests and together with the president you come up with an area where you can collaborate where you can donate funds you can donate time and it's really unique to each, and each entity um, but these contributions are really integral to the university's success and there has been some really great things that companies have done um, and programs that have been put in place that wouldn't have been there without the RT Park clients so this partnership is really important. And UVI was in 2021 was ranked number seven of the top public schools among Southern regional colleges. So it's a good school to be connected with. So now what is required if you want to apply or you're a client already? 
So I'm not gonna go into too much um, of the, the how-to if you, um, when you're done, if not when, when, not if, <laughs> we're done today, you want further information and you'd like to, to talk about how you can put forward an application, you can contact me and I'll go through the minute details. But um, it is important to note that there's a, a fee structure involved in the application. So we're in the, both the application and ongoing uh, membership. So you start with initial certificate fee. Uh, this is the one-time payments up front to join the park. There's annual management fees. These, both the initial certificate fee and the annual management fee are negotiated and discussed when you apply. So the RT Park client review team looks at every application, looks at what your company's doing, how big you are, uh, what impacts you have in the territory, what your revenues are gonna be, and um, with through discussions with you and generally your attorneys, Dory and Erica, uh, we put together a fee structure for those. Um, there is an RT Park equity requirement. So the way that the program is set up, the way it was mandated requires that we take an equity stake in every company in order to be able to provide you access to the tax incentives. So generally it's very, very small. And we usually put in a clause into your agreement that says that there's no distribution requirement. Um, but it is important to note that we do have an equity stake, no matter how small it is. I know in, in a lot of businesses, that's, that's important. Um, we also put in a clause for a buyout. The contracts, as I mentioned, are 15 years. If for any reason, whatever that may be, you decide you need to, to, to terminate your contract earlier than that, there's a clause in place to, to allow you to purchase back your equity. We refer to it as the buyout fee. And then of course, the, the UVI partnerships. So that's, um, there's a financial part of that as well. So that all gets codified into your contract. And then of course we have ongoing compliance, the fun part, <laughs> when, once you've become a member. Um, so of course you have to pay the fees, there's adherence to the regulatory requirements, all of which are laid out in your contract. Uh, we do an annual reporting process um, to make sure that we have everything we need um, from you. And the RT Park has a compliance team who's here to help you and make sure that you're doing what you need to do, answer any questions you have, um, and, and make sure that that process is as easy as it can be. So that's where I'm gonna to stop today. I'm gonna to let Jory and Erica take over because they're gonna get into the, the meat of it. But thanks for taking the time to be here. And if you have any questions, you can get in touch with me after and hopefully uh, I can help you through the process. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Wong. Uh, now, uh, please allow me to introduce you, Erica and Jory. Uh, for the next section of the webinar. Um, so first of all, um, let me introduce Majuri Roberts. Uh, she is an attorney in private practice in St. Thomas, USVI. Um, Mrs. Roberts has a firm uh, of six attorneys who specialize in tax, corporate securities, and the business law in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Ms. Roberts holds law degrees from Harvard University, Cambridge University, and New York University. At Harvard, she was development's editor of the Harvard Journal of International Law and editor-in-chief of the Harvard Law Record. Ms. Roberts is admitted to practice law in California, Washington, D.C., the U.S. Virgin Islands, and before the Third Circuit Court of Appeals and the U.S. Tax Court is licensed as a solicitor in England and Wales and in the British Virgin Islands. Her firm is rated AV by Martindale Harbo, the, and Miss Roberts is one of five band one attorneys in the US Virgin Islands as ranked by chambers and partners. Um, next we'll have Erica Killerhouse, who is a tech and a business attorney with an LLM in taxation from New York University and extensive experience advising individuals and entities. In addition to her significant experience in corporate and the transaction law, her main practice focused on all facets of federal tax law, including individual, corporate, partnership, and international taxation, and all phases of federal and territorial tax controversy. Erica Killer Hall, um, 
Prior to relocating to the U.S. Virgin Islands, Erica practiced at a boutique New York law firm that specialized in providing comprehensive tax advice to individuals and closely held corporations. Now, let's welcome Erica and the jury to walk us through the uh, specific procedures of joining RT Park program and how are we set up to uh, administer the tax incentives. Please thank you. Take the floor. Thank you, Yihan. Um, uh, thank you, Shovan. Uh, I'm going to start and then hand the uh, um, Zoom over to Erica. Uh, we have some slides. I don't know if they're. Uh, yeah, I'll share share the screen. Uh, be visible. But many people. The first question: Can everyone hear? Okay. The first question many times that people ask me is. Is this legal and does the federal government know what the Virgin Islands is doing? And I can emphatically say absolutely yes. The Virgin Islands is an unincorporated territory of the United States and has been since it was acquired from Denmark in 1917 to protect the Panama Canal. They kept the Virgin Islands even though the Panama Canal now belongs to Panama. The Virgin Islands Interestingly, and this is another question that Eric and I both get, are we covered by U.S. tax treaties? And the answer is no, the U.S. territories are not covered by U.S. tax treaties, nor can they enter into their own tax treaties. However, the territories are covered by the U.S. treaties of friendship, commerce, and navigation, and bilateral investment treaties. So one of the first things I do if I'm getting an investor in the Virgin Islands from another country is take a look at those treaties because a lot of times they have aspects that do impact taxation favorably. Uh, with regard to the United States, although we are not covered by tax treaties, there is a tax implementation agreement that has the status of a tax treaty between the Virgin Islands and the United States. And there's an active exchange of information that's provided for that in that agreement. And finally, should there ever be a controversy, say a determination of, of whether a transaction should be treated as in a business in the VI or in the United States, there's a special competent authority procedure between the Virgin Islands and the uh, United States uh, that we, one can utilize. With regard to the Internal Revenue Code, a lot of people are really excited that we use the Internal Revenue Code at, under what's called the Mirror Code. And that's been in practice since the early 1920s. And Yeehan, basically- Sorry, just get Yihan to catch the slides up for you. Okay, good. Two more. Good, thanks. Th thank you, Yihan. And so uh, under the Mirror Code, some people say, does the local legislature have to enact it? No, it's automatic um, that it applies to, to the Virgin Islands. And I think this is a real asset. Some of the other territories have frozen the Internal Revenue Code and amended it locally, uh, but we have kept the pure mirror code. And uh, if you live in the Virgin Islands, and I will tell you about residency in a second, you only file one Form 1040 with the Virgin Islands Bureau of Internal Revenue regardless of the source of income, regardless of whether it's earned from your RT Park business or other sources. Um, with regard to uh, corporate tax purposes, the Virgin Islands is foreign, and we can answer more questions about this, to the U.S. So if you're looking at whether a U.S. Comp uh, US VI entity is a, a foreign corporation for U.S. purposes, it is. Um, and we often will analyze such issues as passive foreign investment company status and the global intangible low tax income, which does impact structuring for uh, ownership of non-VI residents. Finally, if you've got a Virgin Islands corporation, you file both places. You file the 1120 in the Virgin Islands, and then if that corporation does any business in the United States, it would have to file an 1120F. So that is different than the rules for individuals. So I indicated that we have the Internal Revenue Code as our tax code. And there are three provisions of the Internal Revenue Code that show that Congress and the IRS very specifically authorized the United States Virgin Islands to give tax incentives 
um, and also authorize the other provisions that we're talking about. Section 934 of the Internal Revenue Code in Section B2 specifically says the Virgin Islands can reduce a remit tax on Virgin Islands source and effectively connected income, although it cannot reduce the taxes of U.S. resident individuals. And so uh, under that umbrella, you have two other sections in 937 that define residency, that define sourcing and effectively connected income. And you have section 932 that spells out where bona fide residents file, which is only in the Virgin Islands. Uh, the Virgin Islands has had incentive programs uh, in place well over 50 years, although the technology uh, focus that we've heard about, uh, understandably, is really in the last 20 or so years. Initially, there was a focus on manufacturing and hotels, which is st are still foci as well now. And finally, very clearly, the Virgin Islands can reduce a remit tax as attributable to income derived from sources within the Virgin Islands or income effectively connected with the conduct of a trade or business within the Virgin Islands. And these are very broad terms uh, and are defined in, in the Internal Revenue Code. Next, we're going to touch on residency and uh, Erica, uh, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> I was going to say, you can go is one more slide. Redefined and, um, but you're going to go on residency or? You can start, you can do uh, physical presence and I'll do closer connection. <laughs> So, the, so now we talked a little bit about how the companies themselves actually get benefits, but what's really interesting about the tax incentive programs in the Virgin Islands is that if you are a bona fide resident owner of a company that's uh, that gets the benefits through one of our tax incentive programs, you are actually able to take a tax benefit on your distributions from the business that has a certificate of benefits. Um, and in order to in order to do that, um, thankfully now we have a pretty clear test on what it means to be a bona fide resident. Um, there were a number of years prior to 2006, we really it was sort of uh, facts and circumstances type tests with not a lot of um, not a lot of direction from the Internal Revenue Service as to what that meant. But now it's a pretty clear test. And uh, in some cases, it's I think it's actually easier to be a resident now than it was before. Um, it's a three-part test for determining residency. You have to meet the physical presence, um, which deals with the number of days that you're present in the territory. And you also need to have a tax home and a closer connection here. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how do you meet the physical presence test. Sort of the easiest way to do it is to be here for 183 days. Uh, if you're here 183 days and you meet those two other tests, then you are definitely a bona fide resident of the Virgin Islands. You would file your 1040 only here with the Virgin Islands and you would be able to take the 90% credit on your personal tax return. Um, on the income derived from the business. But realizing that it's not necessarily easy as much as it is beautiful here, um, it's not necessarily that easy to spend 183 days here for some people, particularly dependent upon what kind of business you're in. The IRS actually came up with a few other options for what you could do to meet that physical presence test. And one of them is if you spend no more than 90 days in the United States during a tax year, um, again, it would be no more than 90 days in the U.S., plus your tax homes in the Virgin Islands, and you have a closer connection here. Um, there's also the one sort of hard test that they came up with for physical presence, which is a person has no significant connection to the United States during the tax year. Um, so that means that you don't have professional licenses in the States. Um, you don't have a place to live that's in your name unless it's a vacation home. Jory can talk a little bit about more about that one. Um, but really, it just means that you don't have any major connection to the United States. Um, you know, if your kids are in college, I don't really think that they're going to look at your kids in the United States as being a significant connection. Um, it may be a concern if your spouse is actually still living full-time in the States, that would be a significant connection to the United States. 
Um, so, but, you know, if anybody's thinking about what, whether or not they could qualify for no significant connection, you know, either of us could follow up with you. We could give you a thousand different fact patterns of what might work. Um, the other option for meeting the physical presence test is if, you, and this was created with retirees in mind, uh, if you have no more than $3,000 in earned income from the United States and you're here in the territory more than you're in the U.S., you'll also be found to meet the physical presence test. Um, and then there's one other test that kicks in after you've been here for a couple of years, which is 549 days over three years. And you're looking at the current year plus the two years prior. Uh, if you have 549 days with a minimum of 60 days in every year, um, then you can also use that as a mechanism for meeting the physical presence test. Um, again, Dory and I sort of go through this on the regular with clients about how to do it. Um, we're happy to talk to any of you offline uh, to give you a little bit more insight into meeting the physical presence test. Um, and then the IRS actually just gave us a gift not too long ago uh, in which they said, so you can't meet any of the other physical presence tests and 183 is kind of hard for you. Well, we're going to actually give you a little gift and we're going to say, and I think this is on the next slide, Yihan. And essentially what they did is they're going to allow you to count 30 international travel days that count as days of presence in the USVI, as long as you're still in the territory more than you're in the US. Um, so the reality of that is I think it knocks it down to about 100 and I think we figured out it was like 150, 160 days or 167 days. Um, so it's some relief, but it, you know, I tell everybody, if you can spend 167 to 183 days here and you spend 30 days overseas, you're probably gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're still waiting for, aren't we still waiting for the final? Right. Um, they're reliance regs, so they're in process. You can apply, uh, use them now, but they haven't been finalized. Uh, Yihan, do you mind going to the next slide? Yeah. I'm going to let Jory talk about tax home and closer connection. Sure. Um, as we indicated at the outset, it's a three part test. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to a physical presence test, there's a tax home and a closer connection test. And even though there are three tests, they are intertwined. I've had some people come and say, so if I'm in the 50 states, no more than 90 days, I don't have to be in the Virgin Islands at all. And I'm like, no, because you have to have your principal place of business here. And the last I checked, if you have your principal place of business and you're engaged in business, you've got to be here. And the second aspect is you've got to have a closer connection to the Virgin Islands than anywhere else. And so um, years ago, I had one audit where someone was on a sailboat registered in the Virgin Islands and they didn't touch base many places and we did get their uh, residency upheld, but that was under the prior rules and that's a very unique situation. I always use the example of, imagine you moved from New York to Texas. What's everything you would do when you move from New York to Texas? You would get a new driver's license, you'd register to vote, you'd open new bank accounts, you'd notify your alumni association, you'd join new clubs. This is not like moving to Mars where we don't have any of those things. So, so that's really the way you want to look at it from my Right. Point. And I also, I have people always tell where you're moving from that you have moved, mm -hmm. file the change of address form with the IRS and locally. Uh, if you've got clubs that you belong to, you know, go to non-resident status. If you have a hunting license, go to a non-resident hunting license. Mm -hmm. Again, um, there are uh, 10 factors that are specifically non-exclusive that are set out in the regulations. And then there is the form 8898, which is mentioned here as well, which must be filed with the IRS when you file your first return as a VI resident. So for people meeting it, moving in 2021, it'd be filed in 2022. Uh, and it asks a few questions that aren't in the regs, like where your car is registered, where do you keep your financial records, and do you have a homestead exemption? Mm -hmm. So uh, I always tell people to look at that form up front. And one thing, uh, we went through the five physical presence tests and you can clearly meet different ones in different years, but the planning should not just be for federal, it should be for state if you're moving from a state that has an income tax. 
So I always recommend to try to do the 183 your first year in the Virgin Islands, particularly if you're moving from New York or California or Illinois, because you're not just moving here, but you are severing your ties with those jurisdictions and they can be pretty aggressive taxpayers. So we always like to incorporate sometimes a state tax expert as part of the planning. Particularly if you're coming from New York, California, and Connecticut, I think those have been sort of the most aggressive ones. Right. And we've had Illinois too. Mm -hmm. So those are important. Yeah, oh, awesome. Um, we'll touch briefly on this because I know we're running out of time, but the other key component, well, for purposes of, of the individual owner's residency is going to be key. For purposes of the business that's being granted benefits, you also want to make sure that you have income that's sourced or effectively connected to the territory. Because you'll remember when Jory talked about the, the congressional authorization for the programs, she indicated that uh, the Virgin Islands only has the ability to reduce tax on income that's sourced or effectively connected to the territory. And these are terms that are defined in the Internal Revenue Code. Section 937 of the code actually references back to 861 through 865 and points those out as the source rules that you would use to determine whether or not your company is actually generating income that's sourced or effectively connected to the territory. Um, for example, service income. Uh, companies that come down here that actually work with the park that are engaged in providing services from the territory um, to the United States or two foreign countries are actually in a really good position because services income is always sourced where the services are performed. So to the extent you have a business down here with employees that are providing services, it's likely that the bulk of your income is actually going to be eligible for benefits. For companies that are sort of on, in the financial sector, it becomes a little bit of a different story because you have to really look to the source of the types of income that you're receiving. Dividends and income, dividends and interest from US-based payors is never gonna be effectively connected, uh, is never gonna be sourced in the territory or effectively connected here. So that's gonna be income that you're gonna pay full tax on. Um, but then when you're looking at things like capital gains, um, you know, in most cases, capital gains are going to be sourced to the residents of the seller, which hopefully would be the territory at that point. Um, there's a little bit more that goes into deciding which capital gains are actually going to be eligible for benefits. I think it's a little bit outside the scope of this. We could be here for an hour talking about that. So obviously, either Jory or myself are happy to follow up with any of you to talk about that. Um, and then the effectively connected rules, those are the same rules that are in 864C4. Um, so that actually looks to activities outside the United States um, and whether or not they can be effectively connected to the territory. Right. And under those rules, again, in many cases, foreign source, but not U.S. source, dividends, interest, royalties on intangibles, insurance premiums can be benefited. Mm -hmm. uh, so, particularly if a business has a more international focus, that's a really important factor to consider. And the other thing to point out, too, is actually the sourcing rules relative to cloud-based transactions. I know that those haven't been finalized yet, but there's a mechanism in this proposed rules to classify the type of income that you're receiving based on cloud-based transactions. Um, whether it's deemed to be a lease or a services income. So those rules would actually be applicable to determining what type of income your company is receiving down here. So we'd want to look at those as well, dependent upon the business model. And I guess one final point uh, before this is um, when you have some U.S.-based owners of a company, you have to be careful to make sure the U.S. base owner is not doing, you know, significant work outside the Virgin Islands. You know, they can be a passive investor. They can come down even if they're not arrested and work here. But if they are doing significant activity for the company outside the Virgin Islands, that's where you could maybe have uh, more of a sourcing issue where a significant portion might not be eligible. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, and we've touched a little bit on the uh, 2017 law. We mentioned uh, guilty, which is a rule that provides that if you have uh, a VI corporation with significant U.S. ownerships and amounts in excess of 10% or more, 
you can have a situation where they're subject to to deem distribution. So we need to uh, when we one of the first things either of us do is look at what the ownership group is going to look like and and advise how to to have that be the most tax efficient uh, that uh, exists. And again, I always prefer when people can be bona fide residents of the Virgin Islands because that fits so well within the program. And it just makes it easier, I think, from the perspective mm -hmm. of not having to worry about allocating source, not creating a trade or business in the United States. Um, it just makes the most sense. And the U.S. Virgin Islands is a great place to live. I moved <laughs> here uh, over 30 years ago and uh, haven't left, and uh, except for short trips. But I think it's a very you know, good place to do business. It's a good place to live. It's got a great community. And Jory moved me here almost 20 years ago, and I haven't left yet, so I would agree. All right. Thanks, I think we're good. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jory and Erica, for the comprehensive presentation on the tax benefits. Um, so now we'll transition into our Q&A session. Uh, I see that we been getting questions in the Q&A box at the, at the bottom of the screen. So now we will have our presenters address those questions live. Um, so we have a dog of us asking, uh, are the tax benefits of the RT Park program absolutely identical to the tax benefits of the EDC program? How are they differ? So I think uh, Peter or Shawang uh, would you like to answer this question? Sure, go ahead, Siobhan. Sure. The answer is yes, they are um, They are identical. So the same benefits that are available uh, to the EDA are available to the RT Park clients. Um, there are certain benefits within that that the EDA, EDC companies might take advantage of more than, than the RT Park, such as um, the import taxes and the 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 building supply the the, the waiver of the building the excise taxes just because tech based businesses don't tend to be quite so so um, capital heavy so but the benefits are available if a company in the Arch Park wanted them they can certainly take them and I think the only other difference would be time period um, for the certificates. Correct. So the RT Park certificates are 15 years and there's a, a 10 year option to extend and then a five year option to extend and uh, EDA certificates, I think, are available up for up, up to 30 years, if I'm correct. On the island, it's 30 for St. Croix and 20 for St. Thomas and St. Uh, John, mm -hmm. and then with some extensions available there as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and uh, the next question we got uh, are from um, an, an anonymous attendee. And then he asked, do you have a list of CPAs in the USVI that are familiar with the tax incentive programs? Um, so we can uh, definitely, uh, I, can, I can answer this question. So we can definitely help you put together a list of attorneys who are available and who are familiar with the tax incentive programs to guide you through the process of uh, allocating your business here. And if you're looking for specifically a CPA, um, yes, there are uh, there are CPAs that, that we have um, relationships with. I know Jory's firm has a CPA. I'm sure Erica does as well, but I work with Jory. Jory CPA quite often. Our CFO is actually a CPA. Um, we we have another on St. Croix that that many of our clients use. Um, so so the answer to that is yes as well. We would love to expand our network. So um, you know if there's anyone that's not on our list, um, we, our our pipeline is large and there's. Um, often more work than, than we all have time for. So as Marjorie and Erica can certainly agree. Um, so, so we're happy to expand that list if there's any CPAs out there listening in the territory. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dora. Um, please type your questions on the chat box if you would like the uh, the panelists to address them live. And um, we'll give uh, a few minutes to see if there's any questions coming in. And also feel free to contact the panelists after the webinar uh, to schedule any one-on-one -on -one consultation or if you have more questions that you want to ask the, the uh, panelists. I'll we'll share the contact information uh, by email after the webinar. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're oh, I'm so impressed with us, team. It is four o'clock on the dot. Four zero zero. Us. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're right on time. So I would like to thank you again for all of our panelists uh, for taking your time to do the presentations today, and I also like to thank our audience for tuning in and joining the webinar. We'll continue to host the webinars and the conferences okay. uh, in the future. And uh, we would love to uh, collaborate with you all from a myriad of industries to advance a sustainable, viable, inclusive, and a safer economy in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, so uh, with that, let's conclude the webinar and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you everybody. Bye-bye.